Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for tuning into the session. Uh, my name is Oli Metcalf. I work on the WIN team at Research House Bloomberg NEF. Uh, we work on key topics such as technology trends, uh, cost analyses, policy, uh, and installation forecasts. Um, just, just a bit of housekeeping before we, we begin. A, a gentle reminder to submit your questions uh, as, as, we going, um, as we go along. Um, I'm, I'm planning to leave plenty of time for questions. So it'd be good to have your input at the end of the session. Um, but onto the panel. So uh, Bloomberg NEF estimates that 4.3 gigawatts or 3,500 turbines will reach the end of their 20 year uh, design life in 2020. Uh, and we're predicting this will rise rapidly to almost 40 gigawatts in 2030 alone. Uh, so given the volume of turbines that are reaching this point, uh, an accurate analysis of turbines and their components remaining useful life is essential uh, for asset owners um, who are looking to really push beyond 20 years to 30 and even beyond. Um, so careful planning of operational strategies uh, can also help uh, optimize lifetime and boost energy production. So today we've got a, a great lineup of experts with a, with a host of experience in, in what successful life management of wind assets looks like. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a really stimulating discussion. Uh, firstly, we have Babak Nejad, uh, who is an asset manager leading investor and an asset owner, Greencoat Capital. Uh, Babak leads uh, Greencoat's life extension program. Um, then we have Chris Jacobs. Uh, he's, he's down as unknown user, but um, that, that's Chris J Jacobs from a cubicle sustainable investments. Um, he is the global head of en engineering um, and, and Cubico develops wind, um, wind projects in a wide range of markets across Europe and the Americas um, and most recently started expanding into Australia. Um, and Chris heads up the, the team looking at the uh, life extension and life management strategy there across the global portfolio. Uh, and finally, we've got two DNV GLers on the call as well. Um, Keir Harman, uh, Director of Asset Optimization and Management at DMVGL, uh, who can give us a, a high-level global predict uh, perspective. Uh, and then Ali Garashi, who's um, based in the US, Head of Section for Wind Independent Eng Engineering. Um, so great to have you all on board and, and, and looking forward to the discussion. Um, Babak, I, I was hoping to start with you. So. Um, Greencoat in 2019 ran this uh, life assessment study across your entire portfolio. Um, it resulted in, in you adjusting your assumption across all your assets from 25 to 30 years. Uh, can you take us through the process behind those numbers uh, and what that actually looked like for Greencoat? Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, we, uh, we are an independent owner and um, all our assets are basically in a publicly listed fund and uh, the asset valuation is basically measured through the net asset value. So it's uh, it's always paramount for us to optimize the valuation either through the optimization or uh, extending the uh, lifetime. So uh, back in 2018-19, we, uh, we partnered with DNVGL to assist us evaluating the potential of life extension. So we, we recruited DNV expert. They carried out a very high level numerical study and the outcome was on average, most of our portfolio in UK and Ireland, Northern Ireland can comfortably reach 30 years of operation. And at the back of that, we changed our assumption from 20 years, which is the certified design life to 30 years of uh, extended operation. Uh, so we are still working with the NVGL to maintain those assumptions because it's not just simply uh, changing the, uh, the the value from 20 to 30. There are uh, preparation you need to do. You need to probably retweak your operation to make sure you can comfortably reach to that level. So um, I mean, on average, our asset valuation increased by 6%, six, six I mean, project by project difference. Yeah, oh, brilliant, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I hope we can dig into some of those operational changes that you're making further on in the panel. Um, uh, Chris, it would, be, it would be good to hear from you. So, so for the uninitiated out there, uh, how do you go about estimating turbines uh, remaining useful life? Um, and, and I guess with such a global portfolio, uh, how much var variation do you see across, across uh, your assets in different countries? Yeah, sure. Maybe I could um, I'll start with the second question if I, if I can first, because I think it, it 
it complements um, one of the points that Babak made on, on his portfolio. Um, Kubico did a similar exercise, very similar, where we, we did a, um, a fatigue assessment on all of the wind farms in our portfolio. Um, similarly, we had positive results in our European assets. I think we saw wind conditions that supported 30-year um, life. Um, we have operational assets in Latin America um, where wind conditions are perhaps um, particularly around mean wind speed distribution um, are quite different and some of our results um, we decided that based on the results of the fatigue we should be looking at those in a bit more detail and a bit more study to, to understand that. Um, so that's we take the same approach globally so that's to, to answer your second question about how, how we do that um, the results I think differ and I think how we go into managing that now with the results will, will obviously have an impact on our operational strategy. Um, but how we actually go about assessing the remaining useful life, I think um, there are two aspects to this. Um, one is a, a numerical fatigue assessment um, using narrow elastic model. That, um, well, similar to what Babak and Greencoat did, we, we went through a process to select an advisor who could um, who could have the software and the models to do this. Um, and we, we partnered with DMV also. Um, so the process to do that is establishing what your site conditions are, very, very much in a, in a way that you would when you're um, looking to assess suitability of a turbine um, at the development stage. We have our site conditions. Um, we run those through an aeroelastic elastic model um, to see how the site conditions affect loading. And that's a comparison of uh, those site conditions and the loading assessment based on, compared to the loading assessment based on the design conditions. Therefore, you have um, a number of cycles that you think design conditions or, or the turbine is designed to withstand for fatigue. And you compare that to the number of cycles that you've got on your site condition. And you can get a factor of um, life against your 20 year design um, standard. So that's, that's the process that we've undertaken. Um, I think the next stage of that is in a practical assessment. I think it's useful for the audience to understand that Cubico's portfolio is fairly young. Um, our oldest operating uh, wind farm is 10 years old. So we're not, not actually looking to extend beyond design life at this point. Um, so whilst practical assessments are very, very important, um, I think they will become more important towards the 20 year mark to try and bench, benchmark your, your condition against um, what your, your fatigue and your numerical assessment is telling you. Interesting. So, so uh, you're, you're saying you're kind of leaving that, um, that practical assessment and, and, and it's more of a theoretical approach to, to see the potential lifetime of your assets and, and their, that kind of impact on value. I think that's where we are now at the stage where we are. It's more of a feasibility of um, lifetime assessment where we are. Um, obviously, there are things we already know about some of our assets on the practical side that give us pause for thought. Um, and I think we can come we can come to some of those the technical challenges around specific components perhaps later later in this discussion. But yeah, I think feasibility. We're looking at numerical assessments complemented by what we already know um, from practical assessments. When we actually come to realize this, I think the practical assessment will come much more um, heavily into that decision, where the numerical assessment is just an informative study and it's a practical assessment that we will actually rely on to operate beyond design life. Great. Yeah, so, so um, Keir, I, I, guess, I guess I'd come to you. So it sounds like uh, both of the kind of asset owner participants have gone through a very similar process. Um, how can owners go about improving the accuracy of that numerical life assessment? Yeah, as, as we've experienced, we've worked working with. Uh, we've actually done about thirty gigawatts of uh, numerical assessment around the world, at different different uh, um, levels, um, and we are finding that part of the challenge is is uh, getting high quality data to go into the assessment. Um, you know, we need site conditions mainly. You need uh, there's mean wind speed at turbine locations and, and turbulence intensity and some other. Uh, site conditions and that that's that's quite a challenge getting that data together and getting a reliable uh, reliable input and if we um, added to that we can start to look at if a wind farm's been operating for a, a good period we can actually look at using the actual operating data to improve the 
uh, the inputs. Uh, we can also look at improving the, um, the air elastic model effectively. So you want, want to have as accurate air elastic model as possible in order to, to estimate the fatigue, um, the, the loads and the, and the fatigue life estimate uh, best, best in the best possible way. And then in, in reality, if you wanted to go another step further, we could, you could look deeper into um, uh, validation. So, so some kind of measurement uh, campaign to, to look at how accurate your models are. And um, and uh, yes, and then the other thing to do to improve it even further, of course, is to is to continuously uh, estimate the fatigue uh, fatigue life as the as the wind farm operates. There are lots of opportunities available just to improve the accuracy of the numerical assessment itself. Yeah, yeah, thank you, and and lots to unpack there. Um, I guess I guess something that jumps out at me, I, I, I'll, I'll fire this at you, Chris. Is is um, the quality of your data, the integrity of your data seems so important. Now, it is very easy to evaluate this, or it's easier to evaluate this remaining useful light when you, life when you do have a wealth of operational data, if you've held the asset for a long time. Um, it strikes me that it will become a lot more difficult uh, when um, in kind of an, an, an M&A situation where maybe you don't have access to the data, maybe there's a time pressure, um, how do you find that that changes the process? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I think Cubico has, has grown quite rapidly, so we have gone through um, many acquisition processes. Um, but even when we're assessing our, our portfolio um, data, there's not been as to the, the breadth and quality as we, as we would have liked. But when we're looking at new opportunities, um, I think we, we do want to, Cubico do want to consider specific project asset life and not take, not take an assumption. So it is something we assess during M&A. Um, and again, I, I think you rely on the quality of information that's been provided with you, to you. So perhaps if we're looking to provide, buy into a construction asset, we may have um, Netmask data already available and we're, we're already doing a, an independent energy yield assessment. We can convert that into quickly into a site conditions assessment and very quickly run um, a fatigue um, error elastic model. And I think there are different advisors in the market that, that do this slightly different ways. And some have some have advantages of um, databases of, of loads data that's already built up that can speed up that process. Um, but yes, uh, it's it's a challenge to do that in the time frame of M&A. And I think you have to use some judgment on the results that you are getting because there's likely to be more conservatism in the results when you're doing it um, with imperfect input information and in a compressed time scale. So I think the informative, the numerical assessment is informative, um, but it, it has to come with some understanding of what input data has been used and there a judgment made on the final assumption of evaluation through the, through the acquisition process. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I, I wonder, Babak, do you have anything to add there? Do, do, you, do you take the same approach? It sounds like it, it's much more conservative assumptions are required in, in that kind of situation. Exactly, because, I mean, when you buy an asset, it's not always guaranteed you've got a full history of from the construction uh, and through the operation. So you always rely on the fact, I mean, most of the time, if you buy, buy an asset from the utility type developers, They've got generally good archiving, so we make sure those information are passed on to us, the pre-construction calculation and also the full uh, archive data. But if you are buying asset from a, from a third party developer, um, I mean, it's not necessarily gar uh, for, um, uh, guaranteed that you can get access to all those data. So we pretty much use the same approach as, as Chris said. So we, uh, we try to look back there are tools like the NVGA SSA tool, the site suitability. We try to populate it with the best guess in terms of the turbulence intensity, the shears, to, uh, to 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 get the good valuation over the over the loads, and and the model. But um, yeah, that, that's a risk we need to build into our modeling the conservatism in terms of the in terms of the data and inaccuracy. Yeah, great. Um, uh uh, uh, another thing I was hoping to, to ask you about, because I, I know you have some offshore assets 
in your in your portfolio yeah. is um yeah well, well j just finding out a bit a bit about the process in in off for, for offshore wind assets how that differs from onshore i mean uh, so the, the key difference are the foundations on in in offshores and um so i mean and and quite challenging because offshore is relatively new technology some of the issues we are uh, experiencing is quite new so for instance um we've got offshore round one uh, assets which are on the monopile with the grouted connection so we now when it comes to the asset life extension the axial the slippage of the foundation can be an issue how we would model it in future how we ensure the risk of um, foundation integrity is considered throughout the extended operations. So that that makes it difficult. And with the uh, when you do the fatigue calculation, you tend to model both foundations and the tower together. You 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 would tend to use the integrated approach, so it would require more owner onerous errorless dynamic modeling. Uh, in compare with uh, with the onshore foundation or gravity based foundation which we come across in 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 in, in onshore so um yeah so the the relatively new not not much not, no knowledge around around the foundation integrity um yeah yeah uh, uh, and and is there is there much remedial work you can do around there? I know that when it comes to major structural components, it's it's yes. much it's much more difficult. Well, uh, we have tried to um, um, we work with our um, uh, operational partner. We have come up with some um, design modification to the foundation to combat the uh, ongoing serial issues like axial um, uh, slippage. However, I mean. Ultimately, what you are looking at is the same as the oil and gas offshore oil and gas approach, which is the RBI risk-based inspection, to make sure uh, you can carry on operating it as uh, as long as possible. So the combination of inspection and monitoring should be in place. Structural monitoring, um, um, UT testing at the at the set interval to make sure we can you can you can uh, prolong the, the life of assets. So. Um, I mean, if the safety factor, for instance, on a foundation is three or four, and the foundation is designed for 20 years of operation, maybe you can start with a very thorough inspection on the foundation uh, and, and the key structure component every five years, and then reduce it as you develop knowledge and insight into your asset conditions. So yeah, inspection and monitoring is the is the key is the key yeah, there. Exactly. Yes. Um, before I before I, 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 I I'm aware you'll be waiting in the in the wings alley, um, and I'm, I'll get to you in a sec. It would be good to to hear from you, Chris. Um, uh, so so uh, apart from this this simple assumption that on on some of your projects that you're you, you're able to increase the lifetime, um, what as a result of the the study you've done, what kind of operational changes have you made on on your assets? In terms of um, operational parameters on on controls, we we haven't um, made any changes yet. I think we are we are comfortable with um, either wind sector management pro um, programs that were um, assessed and implemented at um, start of operation. I think the changes that we're starting to make is actually um, going through this process is a is a business uh, is developing our understanding of the technical issues, so we can start to put in record keeping processes, um, we can start to put in monitoring um, programs so that when we are in a position to extend life, we can do so with confidence that we have all the information available at our, at our fingertips and um, all stakeholders in the business understand what we need to go through. Um, I think one of the things that I think we will be paying close attention to is particularly on um, composite structures. I think we look at a lot of the, um, the measurement points on models that we're, we're seeing that um, blade blade root seems to be one of the life limiting um, components. We look at the, the structure of a blade and the composite materials used is probably where there's the biggest variance in, in quality and um, strength. So I think when we come to operate um, at a later stage, I think one of the, the biggest lessons that we'll be, we'll be learning from both operational experience and um, numerical assessments is that our inspections on um, blade routes will need to be um, perhaps done at a more frequent basis than 
um, some of the perhaps steel components where I think we've got um, a bit more confidence in um, both the numerical assessment and the, the types of NDT we can do on that than we will on the, the composite material. That's interesting to hear. So, so the limiting factor is often the blades then? Um, in a lot of cases, yes, the, the, the blade root. Um, and I think if you look at a blade root structure and where a blade um, is connected to your pitch assembly, it's it's an area of perhaps, I wouldn't say weakness. I think it's a, it's a point that a quality piece that needs to be inspected regularly to make sure that what you're assuming in a in a simple aeroelastic model is actually happening on at the turbine. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And and um, and and Babak, I, I guess I guess same question to you. So, have you started making operational changes um, as a as a result of of your findings in in your study? Uh, not, but uh, this is something we are planning. We are obviously we are uh, uh, we are in process of using a digital twin wing Gemini across our portfolio to accurately estimate the remaining useful life. So, at the back of the high level study we carried out two years ago. We are now doing a very accurate modeling, elastodynamic modeling of the, a few of our older assets. So therefore we can build it into the Wing Gemini at the NVGL product and accurately estimate the remaining useful life using the SCADA data. So we got the accumulated damage and we can, um, we can get it updated as the data become available. So the idea is um, in future, if we uh, realize that uh, our particular assets are not reaching the uh, target life of 30 years, either on blaze tower or major structure component. We may decide to do some control or operational tweak, i.e. targeting scenario where we can operate the turbine on the lower fatigue mode. So we may decide to stop the turbine in low wind season to save on the ramp up, ramp, ramp up fatigue cycle and then uh, carry on with the continuous production during the windy season. So we would, uh, we could uh, tweak the operation. In terms of the control parameters, no, we haven't changed anything in, I mean, uh, we, uh, mainly because uh, we don't have the OEM knowledge at this stage. We won't want to void the type certificate. And from the commercial perspective, there might be some implication in terms of the insurance later on. So it's, uh, it's quite a risky area. So we uh, we like to approach it with uh, with slightly more caution. Yeah, that's great, and 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 that's exciting. The kind of use of a, a digital twin you you described there is really taking it from kind of moving from one-off studies to a continuous mm. assessment. So uh, that sounds really like the the step forward. Um, I, I guess I'd throw that question to to Keir and Ali then. So so it, it it was also interesting there to to hear about how you might. Uh, schedule maintenance differently for individual turbines, um, and 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 there's there's the idea that you can kind of kind of upgrade or change the controls on individual turbines. Um, I've also heard re more recently about uh, operators trying to implement this on the on the whole wind farm level. Um, it, it, it would be good to hear about your experiences, um, for, for your wider experiences, I guess, Kira or Ali, on 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 that topic. Uh Ali, shall I just um, just sure, absolutely. talk yeah. about the, the whole wind farm control and then pass over to you for sort of uh, upgrades and, and full upgrades and repowering? Um, just uh, just it, this very much aligns with what uh, Babak and, 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 and Chris have been saying about sort of practical numerical life assessment at the moment um, has mainly been numerical without intervening, but actually, um, you know, going forward, uh, we could um, control the the, wind, the the turbines across the wind farm in a much more intelligent fashion. You can actually um, uh, slightly put turbines into slight yaw to to steer the weight uh, wakes away and, and reduce loading from turbines behind. You can power down the most loaded turbines a bit to get uh, additional power into the rest of the wind farm. Um, it's a it's a balance of uh, upgraded energy and reduced loading. But we, we foresee this uh, becoming more uh, prominent uh, way of, of actually managing lifetime. And, and, and there's a very important aspect of that, of course, is that you don't really want to run the wind farm to the nominal end of life and then start thinking about this. You need to sort of have a prognostic technique where you, where you, where you um, assess the most loaded turbines and, and, and throughout the lifetime you adjust 
the um, the loading on those turbines in much more intelligent fashion than we have previously done uh, in in the industry. So there's certainly that's 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 not really um, you know changing retrofitting components or anything. This is just quite simply changing the control. Uh, and there's many options available, but I think at the moment uh, the, the industry the options are strategic, rather new, but we expect them to be phased in over the next next few years as the um, as the techniques become mature. Um, Ali, great, I'm yeah, <laughs> thanks, Ali. Uh, I know you've been waiting the rings. I was I was kind of uh, I was um, cordoned off a bit of time um, with you at the end to talk about partial repowering and kind of a, a bit more of a US specific case. Um, yeah. Now, people tend to kind of group partial repowering projects in kind of in, 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 into one category. Um, but could you give us an idea about the kind of how these projects vary in scope and what different partial repowerings look like? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so partial repowering, really, the way that it's um, defined in the US, um, it, it comes in all flavors. So. I think what we talked about while back in Chris and, and, and Kier were, were discussing was more about extending the life of, a, of an asset as is. And then the next step seems to be some optimization in terms of control algorithms, either on turbine level or uh, across, the, across the wind farm. And that on itself could be considered a partial repowering, but just on a software level. Now, you can take it further and start you know, refurbishing or retrofitting components. Um, it's been a quite an active um, market in, in the US over the past three, four years, mostly due to the tax um, uh, laws in, in the US. Uh, but we've seen all, um, all ranges from um, you know, minimal changes to some components, depending on the age of the assets, um, all the way to changing the whole um, drivetrain and the rotor, um, tower top components. Um, we've also seen um, projects where the electrical balance of plant and the foundations remain, but all the turbines are replaced with, with new turbines. Um, so it can come in in all different um, different levels and flavors, if you wish. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to hear you mention kind of the tax driver, because at least from my experience, when people are talking about partial repowering in the US, it's much more from a, a commercial rather than technical standpoint. Um, and then when, when we start thinking about tax credits, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on how you think the market will fare as we see the production tax credits start to phase out and, and eventually phase out completely. Um, well, that's a good question. So there are, there are uh, and categorically, we would say there are two different drivers behind partial repowering. One is in line with what's been discussed so far on the panel, which is um, extending the life of your project and addressing maybe technical issues. There were, there were a lot of discussions um, by, by Chris and Bob Ack about monitoring and gathering data. And through that data, you realize that your assets are suffering from a chronic issue. And a certain component is a good opportunity to retrofit that across the board. Um, uh, another angle um, from technical perspective would be increasing um, production. We've seen on average over the past three, four years on the projects that have been repowered in the US, we see on average about 5% increase in production and about 17, 18% in capacity, um, which obviously leads to additional revenue. Um, on the other hand, you can reduce your, your operational costs um, by using uh, more modern components, um, and, and maybe optimize um, o and strategies. Um, but what is really driving the market here is the tax credits, production tax credits, which is for repowering projects, pretty similar to Greenfield. Um, so, so same, same policies apply. Um, we've seen a bit of a fluctuation in terms of the gigawatts of product, projects being repowered in the US. I think in, in 2017, we had around two gigawatts and then it dropped down to about half of that um, the following year. Um, 2019, there was a big rise um, to about over three, three gigawatts of, of assets being repowered in the US. And then uh, 2020, I think by the, by the end of the second quarter, we were looking at about half a gigawatt. So we haven't seen a steady market, but, but the anticipation is that um, it's going to follow the same pattern as Greenfield projects regarding PTC. So we, we, we should see a slight decline um, in, in the activities um, in the US mainly because they're mostly driven by, by um, commercial, uh, commercial benefits at the moment. Great, yeah, thanks. And, and I think you cover the drivers quite, quite well there. Um, I, I guess the, the last question I have is, um, before we move on to the, the Q&A is, is um, in many cases, partial re repairing seems like a complete no-brainer. 
Um, could you give us some examples of, of the reasons why it, the kind of business case hasn't hasn't stacked up? Um, do, do they fall on the on the technical? Is is it does it fall on the commercial side again? Um, I would say it's a bit of both because you at the end of the day you should find an offset between the, the upfront capex that you have to spend to repower your project and then how do you recoup that that capex and then start making profit on the back of it. Um, so I would say if if the tax incent incentives are not in place, um, we've done si some high level um, studies and and the early indications are that not every project is fit for repowering. Um, so. Um, in markets that you have higher offtake pricing, uh, maybe um, markets with um, feed-in tariffs rather than tax credits, those could be more uh, feasible for partial repowering. Um, and also, as I said earlier, if, if a project is um, systematically suffering from a technical issue, then that could justify because your o and costs are going to be high, your downtime is going to be high because your project is suffering from a major, uh, major component issue. So that's an opportunity to, to address that as well. Great, thanks. Um, I, I, I'll jump into some um, into some audience questions. I, I want to leave plenty of time for this. Um, just looking at the one that's been up, upvoted the most, um, it's what are the key factors that result in either a longer or shorter actual turbine life versus design life? Um, does do, does one of our asset operators want to uh, want to answer that question? Uh Maybe I can answer that. Um, I mean, from our experience uh, of doing life extension, we have seen on some project, the choice of turbine wasn't quite optimum or during the construct construction, the site classification wasn't really correctly taken into account. We've got sites where a class two turbines are used our class one site. So, uh, or a site with a very high turbulence intensity factor, so they are the borderline site. So we have seen a structural components, particularly blade and tower uh, on some locations, not reaching um, at, on, on paper, nominal life, not reaching uh, 30 years of operation. So that, that's that been the major, major factors. Um, Chris, would you agree there? Or is there anything else you'd like to add? You're, you're on mute. No, still, uh, still can't hear you. I'll, 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 I'll give you a second, and, and we can come back to you on that one. Um, I guess, uh, I guess, one for you, Keir. Uh, how how do the wind turbine aeroelastic models that um, that uh, you see used uh, across all this experience that, that, that you've got um, compare with the ones that that wind turbine manufacturers give? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very good question. Uh, the um, the uh, OEMs, the turbine man manufacturers themselves, will, will, will undoubtedly have the best uh, aeroelastic model to because it was the the one which the turbine was designed against and, and validated against. Um, uh, so that ideally, when you're doing a numerical assessment and calculating loads and fatigue life, you would like to use that model. Those models aren't readily available because of competitive competition or confidentiality and everything else. So there are ways of, um, I mean, just experience-based uh, using an elastic model to, to come up with a generic um, a generic design uh, has been reasonable, particularly because we're doing a comparison to site conditions. Um, so we're calculating a headroom effectively based on site conditions. So we can use generic models for that scale to, to the size, uh, to the, to the, to the, to the uh, actual turbine scale. There are options as well. I think there are some people who provide uh, options to, to accurately make an aeroelastic model by, by scanning components as well. And this may be very relevant for older machines as well, where, um, where it's, it's one of the best ways of doing it would be to, to scan, scan the components to get the best inputs in for the aeroelastic model. Great, thank you. Um, Chris, Chris, do we have you again? I think you might have have me now. How is that? Yes, yes, we have you there. Um, Apologies yeah, for that. So, go ahead on the question before. So, kind of the, the key factors that result in an increase or, or decrease, maybe life. Yeah, I think it, I, I agree exactly with what Babak has said around um, turbine selection and, and um, appropriateness of class um, or type 
for class um, and conditions. The other thing I would say is also um, similar to what we've seen in the energy yield um, space around over prediction of wind speeds and um, modeling used to do that, where you are perhaps not producing as much energy as you would have um, considered in your pre-construction energy assessment, it's probably because you've mo your your modeling was uh, was aggressive. So you actually you've got um, conditions at turbine locations that are more um, benign than you had hoped for in your energy production, which is actually going to give you an upside on your, your life. So I think if you're looking at where it's more likely to extend life, it's probably also where you're you're not producing as much as you had hoped from your pre-construction energy assessment. So uh, downside on energy production, but at least that gives you an upside on lifetime. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I saw another question down here. So um, yeah, and, and and this is this is an interesting one. So so how many years of of operational experience and data, I guess, would you want to have before you begin doing these these lifetime assessments? Um, Babak, maybe maybe you want to answer that one. I mean, I, ideally, uh, from day one, you like to have the full history. So the more data you've got, more accurately you you uh, you can predict the estimated remaining useful life because that's simply a fatigue calculation. So you need to be able to um, calculate the accumulated damage into the um, uh, operation of the turbine. So more data you've got means you can better calculate the load, you can better calculate the fatigue life, the, res uh, the, the accumulated fatigue life, and hence the residual fatigue. So, um, I mean, but that's simply not possible for most of the project because the project we are looking at particularly are 18 years old. So back in 18 years ago, there was no much drive in archiving data or, uh, or even things archived have been deleted throughout years. So we need to uh, make some compromise. So maybe we can look at whatever we've got, try to second guess or try to um, try to simulate the historical data. Uh, and uh, so I would say uh, having like three or four years of uh, historical data should be uh, should be a reasonable amount of uh, experience to build that, uh, um, to calculate accumulated damage. Yeah, okay, interesting. So three or four years, but ideally from, from day one, you say? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. three or four years, you get you going. Uh, in term, but obviously, there are other factors. So you need to know if, for instance, if you're looking at the Northern Irish side, which are subjected to the severe containment, how that had been played out, because the level of containment in the grid has changed throughout the years with the provision of more renewable resources. That would obviously affect your uh, your fatigue life. Things you need to consider in, in parallel to that. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the, the top voted question at the moment, which I, I'm not sure um, anyone may be able to answer given um, given the, the kind of infancy of the sector. But um, when we start thinking about floating installations, um, how uh, maybe this is one for for Keir or Ali. Uh, how would the, the platform motion affect turbine life? Yeah. I can comment on that if you want, Ali. Uh, Easy, yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer it with complexity. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, so in, in so a lot of this work was originally done for onshore projects. Uh, there's an added le level of complexity going offshore. We've got to consider sea state and uh, and a lot of, of the, the substructure, and of course with floating wind, the sub substructure goes to another another level of com complexity. Um, I think we need to draw on um, uh, oil and uh, exp expertise from the oil and gas um, industry who have been uh, looking at um, fatigue life of, of structures out at sea for a, a long time, and uh, we, we as well, we as DMB, aim to really draw on that experience. And and uh, I think the answer is uh, the answer to that question really is it's complex, but we will have to be dealing with it because our um, floating offshore is on its way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, c complexity is often the answers in, in, in this kind of situation, especially when uh, things are so um, so in their infancy. Yes. Um, oh, so, so a question for you, Ali, and, and, and I, I guess this uh, kind of speaks back to contract scope. Um, so 
has a project ever been repowered by replacing only the nacelle whilst keeping the tower and foundation? Now, this sounds a lot to me like a partial repower. Uh, I would say plenty. I mean, if, if, we, if we're thinking about the nacelle and the rotor, um, I would say that's probably the most common theme that we've seen in, in North America, keeping the foundations and towers in place and, and replacing components at the tower top. Um, I, I would say more common is to probably keep the nacelle in place and, and change the rotor. Um, but we've seen in cases that um, all the tower top components are replaced. Uh, which sometimes leads, uh, leads to a need for a, sort of an adapter piece to, to adjust the new components of the existing tower, especially if, you, if you're um, switching um, OEMs between the existing turbines and the new components. Yeah, we, we like to think about it as an, as an adapter plug from the uh, old components to the new ones. Um, yeah, and it's, it's a, an interesting question, again, on the relationship with the OEMs, uh, maybe a bit of a touch point here, but... Um, how open have you guys, I, I'm, I guess I'm speaking to Babak and Chris here, how ho open have you found the OEMs to collaborating on this question around life extension and, and optimization? Uh, have you found that they're resistant? Do they see it as a challenge or is it kind of a, a, an opportunity to um, kind of achieve aftermarket sales? Um, I think um, the way that we have approached it, I think we're seeing them to be more um, cooperative at development stage. So now when we're looking to um, to uh, purchase turbines and we are doing assessments, I think we're pushing them a lot harder on um, their mechanical load assessments, the conclusions of that, and giving us a bit more detail rather than just a binary answer on suitable, not suitable. I think that's, that's where we are making progress. I think on the operational side, um, I think there's, there's some way to go. And, and I think that's just... Um, perhaps some of the models that the, the OEMs have in terms of their service teams and how much support they get from, from engineering. But I would say certainly on new new projects, it's a, there's more cooperation than there is on the operational side. Yeah, Babak, have you, have you found the same thing? Yes, uh, yeah, I, I find them very cooperative. And in, in, in some cases, some OEM uh, proactively approach you for life extension packages because obviously there's an incentive for them. They can uh, they can sell a long-term service agreement at the back of that. So they've done some uh, numerical assessment at their own end. They decide the project, the particular project can can operate up to 30 years and uh, and they come up with the proposal. Uh, to extend so uh, with, with all availability warranty and, and spare, war, um, spare part warranty. Great. Maybe, maybe, maybe we've got a, a time for another couple of questions. Um, there's one here on lightning strikes, and it'd be interesting to hear how uh, how kind of individual events like a lightning strike are factored, uh, strikes are factored into kind of the long-term lifetime analysis that you guys do. I, th I think... It's a very good question, and I think it, the, the short answer is that given given the nature of lightning, um, I think it's more of an ongoing maintenance thing in a, in a normal operation of a wind farm than specific to, to a life extension assessment. So when we are coming to a conclusion on the, the feasibility um, of extending life and actually looking to extend life, I think lightning is not one of the parameters that we're specifically looking at in context to life extension. Yeah, um, great. Um, I'm just flicking through the questions. Maybe we've got one. Um, so in the industry, is a focus extending life of components or on repowering with newer designs and improved performance? I guess, I guess, Ali, could you speak on this in terms of the approach of U.S. asset owners that that, that you've you've experienced? Is the focus very much on kicking this life extension question down the road and a focus on repowering, or uh, is it a, a joint approach? Um, I would say we've, we've seen a mix, really, um, a bit of both. Um, obviously, repowering is in is in full swing at the moment in the U.S. Um, but as I said earlier, because of commercial reasons, um, maybe as well as technical, uh, but there's certainly a an, an appetite for extended life, and we're seeing it more and more. Actually, new projects being designed uh, to start with for for longer period of time. Foundations being designed for 40 years, electrical balance are planned the same thing. On turbines, um, we still really haven't seen turbines being certified beyond 20 years, but we're seeing OEMs actively providing 
load assessments for their turbines uh, for 30 years uh, or more. Uh, so the appetite is certainly there for uh, extension uh, as well as repowering. Great, thanks. And, and, and I'm aware we've, we've hit our time. So I guess the, the only thing that remains to do is to thank our speakers today um, who've joined us for the session um, and to hand over to Mattia Boccolini, um, who will be your moderator for the Meet the, Meet the Experts uh, session. So uh, Mattia, over to you. Good morning, everyone in the US and good afternoon to all the colleagues following us from Europe. So, uh, yeah, I would like to also say thank you to our very important and interesting panel. And so I will wait a few seconds before we can kick off this meet the expert sessions because I will be joined by a few colleagues from mine. So I can see now Prisula online. And shortly we have also Marina and Sijon. Perfect. Okay, so let's kick off this session with a brief introduction. So my name is Mattia Boccolini. And in the MGL, I lead Right, can you hear me? Okay, so thank you everybody for being here today. So I start this session with a brief introduction. So my name is Mattia Boccolini and I lead the, in the BGL, I lead the service area renewables advisory, a function that ensures quality and continuous innovation of our services in this area. I would like to introduce uh, the colleagues that are here with me today. Uh, and so you already know Kira Harman and Adi Gorashi. So Kira will still provide uh, us insights through based on his experience on uh, lifetime management and strategies. Ali will be happy to share his, his experience on the risking strategies for life management, but also on partial repowering in the US. And then three new arrivals in uh, this stage. So Crisula Angelopoulou. Crisula is a principal engineer and business manager for onshore wind due diligence in the UK and Ireland region. Crisula has been involved in several transactions. And several transactions where extended life or optimized operation has been assisted by investors. Then we have with us Marina Carrion. Marina is a senior engineer and a technical lead for numerical life assessment. And he has experience in site suitability and life extension projects, and is here to provide insight regarding wind turbine loads assessment. Eventually, Sijon Chan. Sijon is head of section for wind and solar energy assessment in the US. And Sijon has gained significant experience in generating insights from Reconstruction um, or SCADA data, data sets coming from renewable assets, but also on, uh, on digital things. So, welcome everybody. And before we really start with uh, you know, your uh, with the insight from my colleagues, just a message for the audience. We are here to answer your questions. And then, you know, questions can be posted through the platform. You should know now how to do it. So there is a specific button on the left side of your screen, an icon with a question mark. Then when you post questions, everyone can then vote for the most interesting questions. As a consequence, this will, uh, let's say, go up to our attention and, you know, the upvoted questions will, will get more chance that they will be picked up and answered. Okay, while I see the question box filled in, I would like to kick off with just a question maybe for Chrisula. And maybe Chrisula, yeah, can you tell us, you know, what, in your experience as an advisor, you know, what are the most critical factors that you have seen, you know, when a wind farm owner evaluates the different options that allow the optimization of, of their own strategy? Thanks, Mattia. Um, it was great to hear Babak and, and Chris in the previous uh, session, and I guess some of that might, might have already come through from, um, from what they were saying. 
I guess in, in our experience, I guess the main considerations, unsurprisingly, I guess, are um, things like safety, um, costs, um, revenues and rates, rates of return. And um, so kind of translated into, into technical terms, um, investors and owners would be looking to, to maximize their energy production and therefore their revenues, while at the same time ensuring safety of operations. And therefore, this is where the, the structural integrity of the turbines of the machines is, is coming in. And of course, we're mindful of, um, of the operational expenditure of the OPEX um, that they're spending to, to maintain the projects to achieve those goals. So diff different owners will have different KPIs for this. So um, the, the, the focus may shift depending on, on the strategy of each, um, um, each owner. So thinking about um, about optimized strategy, I guess expertise on assessing things like the energy production, calculating fatigue loads and determining asset life, um, cost modeling, um, looking at failure rates, benchmarking failure rates, and of course, um, also thinking about um, power prices um, throughout the project life. So, you know, um, I think, um, this has been touched upon a little bit in the previous sessions, but obviously, when um, um, you've, you may have subsidy subsidies um, for, for the whole of the project life, or you may have uh, partially contracted revenues, or you might have um, uncontracted revenues or subsidy-free projects for um, for the whole lifetime. So these are all key decisions um, and key items to to for the for the investors to to make basically the decisions on the um, optimization of of their strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I see one very interesting question. And I would say this is an open question. Maybe here you can start, but you know, feel for the others, feel free to uh, chip in. Um, so, do you see that there should be an increasing design requirement in terms of CapEx? Okay, to let's say, reduce the OPEX uh, in the in view of you know a better or uh, say a better lifetime extension in the future. Yeah, um, in terms of the the uh, so the actual uh, capex. Um, so there's there's it's interesting. We did we have seen and Ali could probably expand on this a bit. A bit but we've seen some um, uh, turbines certified for longer. Um, so some some cases where the OEM has come forward and, and said that they'll be, be prepared to certify a turbine for 35 or 40, even 40 years. There's a case uh, last year of, of a manufacturer doing that. So in terms of uh, that would obviously mean additional uh, material uh, and stronger components to to, to provide a longer fatigue life. And um, the other thing that's very important as well is we're seeing uh, the emergence of wind farm control um, as a, as a as a reality. And uh, and that will be a component in, in, in managing lifetime, and uh, and therefore when you're originally specifying the machine, maybe you, could, you should look at the machine being able to operate uh, in 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 a continuous um, uh, off-axis um, situation with a yaw error effectively a forced yaw error, um, and, uh, and 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 that the, the turbine could and should be designed in the first place for that. So, so future-proofing the turbine for the more complex control strategies to, to manage lifetime. Yeah, I, I may be able to add to that a little bit. Um, uh, certainly, as I said during the panel as well, that the trend is to design um, for longer term or more durable components. Uh, but I wouldn't say that necessarily um, uh, correlates to higher capex, um, if you will. Um, for instance, uh, we're seeing a steady decline in, in turbine pricing in North America. Um, I mean, over here, the turbines are still certified for 20 years quite commonly, um, but, uh, but the load assessments um, by the OEMs are done for a longer period of time, 25 or 30 years. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the turbines themselves are necessarily more expensive. And if, when you look at components like foundations, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, fatigue assessment wasn't really a, a major design driver for foundations. But nowadays they are, um, uh, so that the foundations are, are more durable. They're designed based on fatigue loading for longer term, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna cost more to build those foundations. So I don't think there's a, there's a direct correlation between cost and, and the durability. 
Okay, thank you very much. So then we have an interesting question, I believe, for Marina, and that relates to yeah, data to undertake fatigue life calculation. So in particular, it asks which data you exactly need for undertaking such calculation, and if there is any specific resolution which is considered suitable for for this kind of data. So if you know, the minus scatter data is helpful to calculate fatigue loads or otherwise, and then if you basically are, let's say, get all the information from CMS systems. Um, yes, thanks for the question. Uh, so to get, uh, to, to perform the fatigue life uh, calculation, uh, you need essentially, I think Babak already mentioned in, in the in the plenary session what the site conditions. So you need to know uh, the, um, the wind speed distribution, you need to know turbulence and other uh, parameters such as wind shear, um, density uh, and uh, the complexity of the terrain. So in terms of the SCADA, SCADA data, 10 minutes is the typical resolution that is used. Um, and this should be enough to capture the, the full operational um, um, life of, uh, of the turbine. So perhaps uh, I think Sijian has a um, lot of experience on SCADA and maybe he could um, add some into it. Yeah. yeah, thanks Marina. Uh, yes, definitely uh, there's a lot of aspects you can look at. Um, so certainly yeah, power uh, from the SCADA data uh, uh, would be helpful. And then looking at not just power, but like blade pitch, uh, because turbulence intensity really does matter. And so looking at the pitch standard deviations, as you know, from the pre-construction side, you need to have a met mass, but that may have been 10, 15, 20 years ago. So uh, the typical ways of looking at uh, pre-construction site suitability may not be as relevant now that you literally have pad by pad uh, information. So let's best utilize that uh, with yeah, 10 minute power, uh, 10 minute pitch standard deviation. And I think we, yeah, and Ali mentioned about the foundation. So I'll take this opportunity to say that um, maybe what you built that uh, turbine 20 years ago, you probably didn't factor in, oh, let's make this a 50 year plant <laughs> and uh, put more turbines in. So the foundation may not be adequate for that long. And I think it's uh, often hard to figure out what the foundation health is like. And so one way is we've been exploring more of is looking at one second data to see how much the tower wobbles. And so you can kind of have a better sense of uh, the tower frequency if it's much deviating from uh, the set uh, parameters. And so you can look at one second data, look at the power or generator speed, rotor speed, to get a better sense of um, the, the, the foundation health uh, with that approach. Thank you, Sijun. Allow me to say is yes, you have touched a very interesting point. Uh, the, yeah, how uh, a wind farm owner can take informed decision. And we have understood that in digital twins in the, on this regard can play a role. And can you say more on uh, they say the key benefits that you see and also on I don't know, potential constraints or risks, if any? Yeah, absolutely. So uh yeah, to have a digital twin, you literally yeah, take the on-site conditions at that turbine, feed it into a turbine model that you know has these kind of loading impacts. And so sometimes I get the question of, hey, well, like what turbine should I really inspect first? I'm like, let's look at your data, let's look at the fatigue, and then say like turbine 12 has the most loaded blades. So definitely look at the blades for turbine 12. Maybe you don't need to do all 20 turbines in your site or all 50 or however many turbines, but I would certainly look at uh, the ones that are most fatigued from blade aspect, yaw bearing towers. And so getting uh, that information uh, and running it through a, yeah, a digital twin can help you provide more data driven insights and actions from that. Thank you. Then you have another question from the audience. I believe it can be say question maybe both here and Marina can say something. So ask if it is possible to manage loadings across the farm using intelligent controls. And then okay it continues saying it's also possible to increase loadings on individual turbine to simulate accelerated um, life testing prior to the physical condition assessment. Yeah, so in terms of intelligent controls, uh, there's uh, this um, approach that I think now is 
setting up with the Windham control. So Windham control is essentially you are taking not the individual turbine but the whole wind farm as a whole, and then you are trying to optimize the set points of the controllers to make sure uh, so knowing where um, where the wake is coming from, and that will be this is uh, one of the let's say most advanced um, approaches that is now picking up. Uh, in terms of accelerated life, life testing, uh, I don't know. And maybe here, you know more about this. So, if I understand it correctly, it was about accelerating uh, the lifetime. Uh, so I think if we, there, there's a very good question actually, because a lot of projects that are under support mechanisms are receiving, uh, I mean, maybe several multiples uh, of the of the of the income uh, post subsidy, basically. So there is this question about uh, lifetime management rather than just extend. Uh, there is a possibility of yes, uh, sweating the assets uh, and potentially even wind farm control itself is a balance because um, what you by putting turbines into a uh, force your your position you may increase some loading and it's a balance effectively. And so you may increase the loading on one turbine, but the the the, the loading on the turbine behind significantly decreases. So I think, um, I said in, the pre in this previous session, that complexity, the uh, complexity here is giving opportunity, really. It's the complexity of the, of the situation can um, give us opportunity to optimize. And um, uh, there's, yes, there's a lot, a, a lot, a lot to work on in that, in that respect. Thank you. So, yeah, Crisula, I know that you have worked, let's say, in several transactions, but also in a several, let's say, uh, project financing. So, in your opinion, I mean, if you have, let's say, a wind farm which is financed by lenders, okay, what do you think are, you know, the aspects that are evaluated by the lenders when, you know, an owner proposes to install upgrades or to consider, you know, uh, Say maybe extension of the of the life or you know other other kind of uh, say um, measures that can improve the value of the plant. Mm. Yeah, so um, we see a lot of our clients um, um, getting proposals from from the manufacturers on, on on a package. I guess this hasn't been really touched upon in, in the previous sessions, but. Um, it's very common these days to, um, especially for older turbines, to um, to get an offer to install, for example, um, hardware. So like aerodynamic upgrades of vortex generators, gurney flaps, and things like that, or to install software upgrades by by the manufacturers. I noted that um, you know Babak talked about you know the the certification not being voided, but obviously if if, if the OEM does does those um, software upgrades, then um, they'll have control over that. Um, but essentially, um, absolutely, when when um, we've got lenders involved in the project, it's important to um, to assess the risks associated with that. And I guess just to note to say that typically, you know, that lenders will, will be looking at the kind of the downside side. So um, a downside case. So I guess we'd be um, checking things like, um, you know, what what is the nature of the of, of the upgrade, upgrades to explain that to the lenders you know how long it will it take to, to install them does that mean a lot of downtime for for the project a lot of loss loss of revenue and um, make sure that it's uh, modeled correctly um in terms of um kind of the capex and sometimes and um, there's, there's a capex involved or or a revenue sharing mechanism um, it's also important to look at at the validation of, of those upgrades um, and to essentially to to ensure that the project is, is not worse off um, when when these um, these um, upgrades are installed. Um, and, and, and in a nutshell, we'll just uh, I guess ensure that there's there's no kind of material risk associated with um, with the installation of those upgrades for for the lenders of the project. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we have another question from the audience. So yeah, we have been asking, would the panelists agree to the following hypothesis? So a wind turbine with 20 years, certified design lifetime, 
in 2010 is okay more safer i would say than 25 years certified lifetime today a bit provocative question but yeah maybe it's maybe i would say that perhaps uh, before years ago the the level of conservatism was higher in the sense that the elastic tools that we had were not so uh, fine-tuned so perhaps nowadays because of the new techniques new developments maybe the designs are more uh, uh, sp uh, like more to the limit perhaps than before um, yeah probably um, i wouldn't say they are they were safer but probably they were more over design in the past mm -hmm. um, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So, um, Ali, if, if we move back to the US, um, I mean, I'm okay. You talk a bit on partial repowering, and you know, we understand this, you know, extremely common in North America. Um, I mean, in your experience as, as advisor, can you share with us some, um, some, let's say, do's and don'ts? of partial repowering. I mean, yep. just imagine you, know, you have a customer in front of you and what would you suggest to me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, um, I can I can maybe talk more about the, about the do's and uh, the sort of tying to the opposite would be, you know, um, the, the don'ts. But um, so to start with, obviously, because in the U.S. they're driven by by tax policies, and obviously we're not tax advisors, but mm -hmm. um, before anything else, they, the customers need to talk to tax advisors to make sure that their project actually qualify for partial repowering. There's there's certain metrics there, um, but when it comes down to um, the, the the technical aspects of it, one thing that was mentioned on the panel as well, not in the context of repowering, but it, it equally applies here is the value of data. So uh, we certainly encourage customers to collect accurate SCADA data over a long period of time for um, accurate assessment of uh, improvement in performance and energy capture after repowering. Um, when it comes down to loading, we really um, rely on the OEMs. The, the, the loadings um, come, from, come from the OEMs um, and, and typically they have accurate data. Um, Things that we advise customers upfront to to be to be um, cognizant of um, is what I mentioned earlier: foundations uh, more than anything else in, in terms of the structural components. Um, projects in the U.S. That, are, that go for repowering they're usually over 10 years old, which is past their flip time for their initial um, uh, tax equity investment. And about 10, 15 years ago, um, foundations were not designed necessarily based on fatigue loading. So a, a thorough desktop review of the foundations, assessing the, the accumulated fatigue damage in the foundations, what is left of the useful life in the, in the existing foundation, that's quite critical. And we've seen a wide um, range of outcomes from um, foundations passing the, the standard criteria today as it is, um, which has changed obviously and evolved over the years, um, to those that need, they need ongoing inspection and monitoring to make sure um, of the integrity of the foundations after repowering. And then all the way to cases that um, at, at one or the other type of retrofit was needed to bring up the, the foundation to the current standards. Um, I would say that's probably one of the most um, um, crucial parts when it comes down to technical assessments of the, of the, of the assets. Um, with, the, with the turbines, um, Ideal situation is that the OEM who's repowering the turbine will certify the turbine for 20 years um, by a third party, uh, obviously, uh, and that's been the majority of the case, and that alleviates a lot of concerns by the investors and the lenders. Um, if there is no certification for the reconfigured or repowered turbine, then a, um, a detailed uh, load assessment and size suitability obviously would be needed, uh, which needs more time and costs more money. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, yeah, next we have let's say, a question from the audience, and it asks which areas of the turbine do you see as most critical to expect in orbiters in a lifetime operation, extended lifetime 
uh, operation. And you know, if Marina or or maybe here, is, I would say this is no question to you. So yeah, I, I, I could take this uh, um, this here. Um, right. So in terms of um, really, this is about um, what we recommend is is a approach of risk based inspection. So your numerical assess assessment should give you a feel for which major components. Are, um, are becoming the life limiting components and therefore you should probably focus on those and then understanding the design as well, the design itself uh, and understanding potential modes of failure are very important. So it will, it will depend, uh, but what I would say you should start with is if we were to do uh, a uh, fatigue life assessment and you discovered that as one of the component, components, for instance, the um, the blades or the hub with a, with a life limiting component, then you should look at um, a, 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 an inspection regime suitable for that uh, that component as it reaches end of life. Uh, so, and uh, yes, just understanding modes of failure is, is extremely important. And that will give you a, a pinpoint of where you should be um, focusing your inspections. And then if a wind farm itself, obviously, uh, Turbines, um, certain turbines on the wind farm will be more loaded than others, and we also recommend, obviously, um, inspection re re regime that takes that into consideration. So, consider inspecting the most loaded turbines first. Okay, thank you. So, then another question coming from the audience is. Um, if a wind turbine has seen many neighboring turbines erected through its lifetime, is it possible to consider these turbines in a chronological order for you know, fatigue and turbulence calculations? Maybe Chrysula or Marina here. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I can answer probably, that. Yeah, probably a bit more from Marina, but yeah, my yeah, my first uh, answer would be yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So as a rule of thumb, whenever we are looking at the remaining useful life of a wind farm, we should consider always the neighbors because uh, they essentially they are going to contribute to an increase on the turbulence due to the wakes. So if we have a situation and we had projects like this where uh, we know that in the next five years there's going to be a wind farm building up, then we should be including those uh, at the right time. Uh, the same way if we know that some neighboring turbines are going to be the commissioned, so we can uh, we should take those those in, into account and do the analysis in a scalated way so we can consider the whole chronolo chronological change uh, on, on the layout. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe we have time for a last question. So we have um, again from the audience, Enrique Martinez asking, how critical would you find to perform a load measurement campaign to validate the aeroelastic model before big performance enhancement intervention is made? For example, the air reblading, so the change of the rotor. So, yeah, Marina, maybe again, on, or also, Lee, of course, maybe with the, the experience in the US, maybe you can say you know, more in terms of validation of the models. I mean, it, it really comes, sorry, go on, Marina. No, no, no it's, it's fine, Ali, go ahead, yeah. I was just gonna, I was just gonna, since there was a mention of a change of rotor, so I, I, I thought it would sort of lean more towards repowering. Um, as I said every, every, earlier, um, the, the information really, um, when it comes down to us as consultants, uh, it, it's from the OEMs. Um, but the, the detail and the accuracy of, the, of that data is quite crucial because that's the information that, that can define what is the, uh, what is the fa fatigue damage already um, on the components and what is left. Because typically here in the US, when you repower a, a, a project, you expect another 20 years of life. So you say your project is 15 years old, you want to add another 20 years on top of it, total 35. 
So you need to have that information to have a, an accurate assessment of the of the fatigue damage on, on the components. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but um, that will be that will be my hunch. Yeah, Marina, if you could want to add anything. Yes, I was just. I, I agree with what Ali just said. I was just gonna say that perhaps you can use. Uh, maybe you don't need the full validation to get the first idea. So you could perhaps do a high-level analysis using a, a more generic um, uh, model, and then based on what you, the sort of loads that you get and what uh, sort of lifetime you are you are expecting, then you could move on into the the validation to to refine more the analysis. Okay, thank you. I believe the time for the session is over, so I would like now to just say thank you to you all, but also to the uh, audience, to, and I hope you found this um, meeting interesting. You can keep engaging with us through the platform, so if you go now back to the lobby, then you can find the virtual booth, and there's amongst the virtual booths, one named the life management to extend optimized for repowering. So if you click on it, you can keep chatting and not texting with us, and we will be happy to keep answering your questions. Thank you very much for today. Bye. Thank you.